my name is Mike Rempel. I'm the director of the Data Collaborator for Justice at John Jay College. I'm going to introduce the panel. We have Sandra Smith, professor of criminal justice at Harvard Kennedy School. Aubrey, there you are, Aubrey. Aubrey Fox on the other end, executive director of the NYC Criminal Justice Agency. Olive Liu, who works with me. She's a senior research associate at the Data Collaborator for Justice. J.O. Kim, associate director of research at the Vera Institute of Justice. And Jennifer Perone on the end, associate research director at the CUNY Institute for State and Local Governance. Here's what we're doing. Sandra is going to kick us off because she has done research on bail reform nationally. So we're gonna start by widening the lens. The other four speakers are going to then bring us back and share some of their key takeaways on the research in New York. We are going to make every effort to have time for Q&A. If you are sitting at home, you can participate in Q&A, but you're going to have to go to Twitter. Please tweet your question and use the hashtag NY bail conference, hashtag NY bail conference. Your question will be seen and we will try to get to a few. If you're here in person, you don't have Twitter, there should maybe be index cards you can write on. If Yes, if you have something to write on, someone will come around at the 45 minute mark and we will try to collect your questions as well. Okay. I'm going to step back and do a minute of level setting, and I'm going to turn it over to Sandra. I know many of you watched the plenary. I just want to review New York's bail reform. What is New York's bail reform? What are we talking about? We're talking about five fundamental components that were put into the law. Number one, bail reform is no law, bail and pretrial detention are no longer permissible in most nonviolent cases. Number two, supervised release must be available to judges as an option in every single case. But number three, neither supervised release nor any other pretrial condition can be set unless someone poses a credible risk of flight to avoid prosecution. Number four, even if there is a risk of flight, judges must use the least restrictive condition necessary for assuring court attendance. And number five, judges, when they believe bail is the least restrictive condition, must still look at what people can afford before actually setting a bail amount. Okay, that's New York's reform, but as I said, we want to give a broader lens to the conversation. So I'm going to kick it over to, um, to Sandra on, uh, on national research. Just to be clear, the research that I've done, um, the research that I do, <laughs> thank you, um, is primarily f focused on the conditions of people's or the people's experiences in pretrial detention. So I study the conditions of confinement and also the impact that those conditions have on people in order to understand that within the various contexts that I have studied the experiences of pretrial detention. I also ha have done this kind of landscape analysis with the assistance of an amazing um, research assistant that I have at Harvard, Isabella Jurgensen. And so I'm drawing from that, but also my uh, work on, on people's experiences in pretrial to speak today um, and look forward to the, the discussion later on about the conditions. So in 2016, several defendants filed a class action lawsuit uh, against Harris County, Texas for unconstitutional bail practices against people arrested for misdemeanor offenses. Specifically in O'Donnell um, et al. versus Harris County, the plaintiff class uh, accused the county of setting bail amounts so high that many were detained pretrial for no other reason than that they could not afford bail. To end litigation, the county agreed to reform its pretrial systems and practices to protect the due process and equal protection rights of individuals arrested for misdemeanor offenses. Among other things, the O'Donnell consent decree requires that most misdemeanor um, defendants be released immediately on their own recognizance, so without secured bail, um, that those ineligible for immediate release be granted a hearing 
and access to an attorney within 48 um, hours of arrest, and that when secured bail is imposed, not only should the amounts assessed be based on evidence of a de defendant's ability to pay, but also that less restrictive conditions could not reasonably ensure that that person would show up to court for their hearings. The decree also established a role for an independent monitor to evaluate compliance, track the effects of new practices on relevant pretrial outcomes, and promote transparency by publishing regular reports on the progress of the decree. In March of 2021, two years after bail reforms were implemented, the independent monitor released a second of two reports. Um, in it, they, uh, they, they reported uh, from analysis estimating the effect of bail reform measures um, um, and what those effects have on misdemeanor defendants' current and penal system outcomes. Specifically, since bail reform, while the average daily misdemeanor jail population has declined significantly, there have been no observed increases in recidivism rates among those released pretrial that would suggest a public safety threat. The report also addressed speculations about the effect that bail reform has had on spikes in violence. We've seen this across the country. The report says, as murders have gone up in Harris County with this year's totals, the highest in years, members of the public and public officials have understandably sought explanations. We have noted some public statements linking homicides to bail reform. However, we find no evidence that bail reform has led to an increase in homicides. And those who have asserted otherwise have not identified any data to support the assertion. Thus, the monitor's core findings were in line with the court's finding in O'Donnell that money bail does not meaningfully promote public safety or court appearance or appearance in court. There was a formal response by the Harris County District Attorney, Kim Ogg. Um, it was swift and unequivocal. She criticized the monitor's recidivism-related findings and analysis. Based on her own office's um, um, analysis of the same data, she reports not only that bail reform led to substantial increases in recidivism, recidivism rates, but also that increases in violent crimes were directly attributable to reform-related pretrial release practices. Speaking for prosecutors, for police, and for crime victims, she said, whose daily experiences were claimed to conflict with um, the monitor's recidivism findings, bail reform as presently practiced in some Harris County courts will continue to be a driving factor in the crime crisis gripping, this, gripping our community. Her message was clear. Harris County's bail reform experiment had failed. Money bail does meaningfully promote public safety and should be reinstated to promote the public, uh, um, pr protect the public from further harm. So as a growing number, this I'm sure sounds very familiar to you, as a growing number of jurisdictions across the country have attempted to implement bail reforms, debates have intensified about the relationship between such reforms and crime, including and perhaps especially violent crime. Similar debates, for instance, have raged here in New York, where the backlash against bail reform has caused the state legislature, legislator, less legislature to roll back key elements just three months after implementation. And now the governor um, has proposed further rollbacks to the law. Um, so although largely driven by politics, these debates raise an important and timely set of questions. What role does pretrial detention and release um, play in producing or threatening public safety? Does pretrial release incentivize crime and drive up crime rates, including violent crime? Here you go. Including violent crime, as many in law enforcement have claimed. Or all things equal is pretrial detention the greater risk to public safety. So here, we should probably think about how we're uh, defining public safety. Typically, what we do is to, to refer to its protective function. What can we do to protect people from um, being harmed or from having their property taken or harmed as well? Um, what I would argue is that we should take seriously an argument recently made by uh, um, NYU law professor Brian Friedman um, I think I've got the name right. Forgive me if I've, I've, I've uh, misnamed him. Um, who argues that 
we need to broaden our understanding of what public safety is. And when we do that, we should include the, what it means um, to have people's basic needs met, right? And so when we think about the impact of pretrial detention, we're not only thinking about what impact it has on crime, that's incredibly important, but we should also think about what impact it has on the individuals who experience it and the communities that they go back to. Um, so when we take this kind of holistic approach, um, we would come to a very different set of conclusions. Um, so but we should also define our terms in terms of, of, of bail reform. Here, when we think about bail reform or when we thought about bail reform, Izzy and I, we thought about any policy change that was intended to reasonably, um, um, uh, was intended to or could reasonably be expected to reduce the number of people detained pretrial. And of course, bail reform can do the opposite, but we were focused on um, making sense of these kinds of efforts <clears throat> in our uh, landscape analysis. So what we find <clears throat> is that over the past, say, 20 plus years, a number of states, more than half the states in the country, have been engaged in some process of bail reform. In some cases, it's just, let's start talking about it. Um, in other cases, it is much more substantial. It might look like what has happened here in New York or what's happened in New Jersey. Um, so we see, uh, uh, okay, so we see multiple, I'm gonna have to go off of my computer for a little while. We see multiple states engaging in efforts and we also see an uptick over the last six to seven years in, in um, states engaging in these efforts. Many of these state legislatures have engaged in these efforts after city and county level bail reform efforts have taken place. And so you see in Brooklyn and Queens efforts going on for as, you know, over 13 or so years ago, um, but in the state we only see um, efforts over the past uh, couple of years. <clears throat> so huge uptick in the number of states that are engaged in these processes. And you can see with this uh, uh, um, map of the US, the states that are engaged, I can't help but to do this, so let me go. <clears throat> so no reforms are found at all in these states where you see the, the lighter color bars. Um, and that's relatively few states, all things considered. And they're kind of located primarily in the south and the northern plains. Some states are taking preliminary steps towards states wide reforms and so haven't done it yet but are certainly engaged in the process. Here are the states with this lighter color that are focused where efforts are largely um, um, rooted in what's happening in cities and counties and so not so much statewide. Um, statewide effort re reform efforts that have been implemented but then sub subsequently limited or reversed. We know that that's happened in New York. It's also happened in, in California and we have some moderate forms in a, a set of other states. But what this shows is a kind of engagement in most states, I would argue, across the country, but what that looks like differs significantly. Um, the examples of the efforts that they're making, we could probably categorize, and I want to think about this a little bit more deeply, but um, in maybe three different categories, where they're changing presumptions um, about, uh, or, and also establishing rights, so as to protect individuals who, who have been brought into the system. So presumptions that people are innocent, presumptions that you will be released um, after your arrest um, and or released on non-monetary um, bail. That you have a right, right to counsel, as ha has happened in Harris County. That there's an expansion of procedural protections um, for you once you are brought into the system so that you can have due process, et cetera, um, and that those will be taken seriously. That also is a part of what has happened in Harris County. And that there's a... Um, uh, you, uh, removal of the presumption um, of detention for some crimes. We also see <clears throat> that um, a lot of efforts have been focused on essentially curtailing judges' discretion. Judges can't just do uh, many of the things that um, they have tried to do in the past. Some of that is through the implementation of risk assessment tools. Um, sometimes that's in, com in combination with judges' discretion, establishing guidelines for what judges um, can or must uh, consider when imposing bail, limiting situations where judges can impose bail, the list goes on. And then in addition to that, their efforts to, to really kind of focus on the, the, the needs that folks who are brought into the system have, expanding um, 
um, social services through pretrial services so that people have access, but also a serious consideration about the extent and nature of the use of bail, generally speaking. So we could, I, I think it's a, a good time to start thinking about what, what these buckets are or, or reforms that we've been seeing, but they um, have made a huge difference to varying degrees in different contexts, and that is what I'd like to talk about at this point. Um, so there, there have been, there were conversations earlier today um, which suggested that bail reform can be uh, linked causally to pretty poor outcomes, um, um, not just in New York, and, but possibly other places. But apparently New York is also unique, so maybe there's something about this unique and exceptional context that makes it so that bail reform has had a particular effect here. What the overwhelming majority of evidence suggests is that bail reform has had no substantial um, effect on crime or violent crime in multiple contexts. Um, one of the things we can look at, and this is of no surprise to us, is the extent to which uh, bail reform has impacted unsecured release. You put in place bail reform, various kinds of measures. It tends to increase the rate at which people are released without monetary bail, uh, without cash bail. That makes perfect sense. It also tends to reduce the size of the jail population. We see this happening in multiple contexts. I'm just giving you a, a set of examples in New Jersey, a reduction of 35%, 26% in New York between 19, um, 2019 and 2020. The statewide decrease has been about um, 31% and about a 33% decline in St. Mary's County, Maryland. In New Jersey, I should um, be very clear that New Jersey's reforms were wrapped into a whole set of reforms, not just bail reform. And so some of that decline is probably rooted in some of the other measures that New Jersey um, took. Um, um, and so we should take that into consideration. It's not just, though, about the unsecured release and the size of the bail population. We also see the impact that bail reform has had on how long one spends in pretrial, generally speaking, the whole uh, experience of it. So not just detention, but from the point at which they were arrested till the case um, has been adjudicated. We do see increases in the, the length of time that takes. But that makes sense, because if I'm not being encouraged to take a plea deal um, so that I can get out of, of, of detention, which has a set of harsh conditions of confinement that would make me, um, you know, it would have a really negative effect on almost every aspect of my life. So I'm not gonna do that because I'm out. I'm gonna take the time, as someone said earlier, to assess my options. I'm gonna take the time to participate in my own, the advocacy of my own case. I'm gonna take the time to figure things out before I come to a determination. That takes more time. So the length of pretrial detention, or not detention, the, the length of pretrial, the pretrial period, we do see increase over a period of time. And this is a good thing, I think. Um, the short period of time usually indicates that, that people are rushed into making decisions that, that in most cases don't work for them. But we also see an impact related on case outcomes. A significant decline in the percentage of people who are found guilty as a result of bail reform. Why is that? Well, because they're out, <laughs> they're participating in their, their, their own cases, being able to, to uh, assist in their counsel so that they can um, um, have strong cases put, up, put forward. And in the case of New York City, we also see in a dramatic increase or significant increase in the percentage of cases that get dismissed. Time out to participate in your own case makes a huge difference. These are good things. Um, and then we also see, this is the issue that, we're, that is brought to us, the public, time and time again, dramatic increases in rates of crime and especially violent crime. We're hearing about the hor horrible deaths that are, the numbers of deaths that are occurring in black and Latino communities, which oddly doesn't seem to lead to investments in those communities, their institutions, community organizations, but does seem to um, um, warrant us investing so much more in these harsh conditions of confinement um, and other penal practices. Um, what we see time and time again with every rigorous study that I have seen is that there's no statistically significant increase in the rate of new charges, generally speaking. And when we do see small increases, in most cases, those can be explained away by natural fluctuations or end up being meaningless differences. 
This is the case as well with regards to violent crimes. No evidence that bail reform is linked to increases in violent crimes. There has been an uptick. We should be taking that seriously instead of, bail, uh, instead of um, using bail reform as the reason for why this is happening. <clears throat> The other thing that we should also be talking about, and I, I didn't have much time to talk about here, is the, the positive impact that bail reform has had. So mostly what we're looking at is the impact on crime, right? The, the absence of the negative, great. But what we're also finding is that in some contexts, bail reform is associated with dramatically increasing rates of employment among black men closing the link, the, the gap that exists between black and white men in terms of employment related to bail reform. This is a, a recent study that just came out of New Jersey related to their um, bail reform practices. So we're seeing improvements in employment as a result of this, which co connects very well with prior research that shows that pretrial detention has a negative effect on employment in the short and long term. Negative effect on being able to bring in your own income in the short and long term. Right? Which speaks to the issue of how we're thinking about public safety very broadly. Because if you give somebody a job that allows them to, to um, uh, um, that pays a living wage, you're very likely reducing the likelihood that they'll come into contact with the criminal legal system. Um, and this brings us to the issue of racial disparities, which will be ta talked about um, a, a lot later. We don't see bail reform having a big impact <laughs> on racial disparities, or not in the way that we would want to. In many contexts, it increases racial disparities, in part because even as you see overall individuals, um, their outcomes improving, it improves much more for whites than it does um, blacks or Latinos, right? And so we need to figure out how to jigger these policies in such a way, or their implementation in such a way that has a positive effect on black and Latino folks as much as it does on whites. This is what's happening in Kentucky. This is what's happening in Maryland. Uh, my understanding is this is what's happening um, in New York too. Um, and that, but we have seen some decreases in Harris County. And so that is an important context to pay attention to. Declining rates in, um, or gaps, narrowing of the gap um, and people who, um, who are being released on bond. Um, and so in the context where that is happening, it makes sense to study how it is that they're implementing and what the nature of that reform is to understand how we, it could benefit blacks and Latinos as much as it does whites. Um, in terms of crafting effective and, and equitable practices or bail reforms, um, I, we, uh, Isabel and I, uh, Isabella and I um, made a, a couple of re recommendations in, a, in the paper we wrote on this topic um, where we're suggesting that there's a presumption there should be a presumption of unconditional pretrial release to recur within 24 hours of arrest. Um, while unconditional release is uh, not, when it, in cases where it's not granted, it's important to require um, that these decisions on pretrial release be made within 48 hours. Why is this happening? And what can we do to get folks out as quickly as possible? This happens in the case of Harris County. Um, establish the, the right to an attorney at the bail hearing and throughout the, the process, um, where judges determine that release with no condition is insufficient, require that the least restrictive conditions be met before um, um, applying uh, cash bail. Um, Pretrial release services must include providing text messaging to remind people of their court dates. Lots of evidence now supports the efficacy of this. It drives up people's appearance rates in lots of circumstances, um, and also provide wraparound services where needed. And then finally, include specific requirements um, for the collection analysis and dissemination of data. In most contexts across the country, the, the access to good quality data to make sense of what is happening, um, what, in, what uh, kinds of factors impact what kinds of outcomes, is woefully inadequate. So for us to better understand what makes a difference, we need access to good quality data, and so each of these contexts should, should do the work to provide it. I will end there. <laughs>
Well, I'll, I'll just start by saying thank you to John Jay and Arnold Ventures for inviting me today. And, and just a note about our uh, panel moderator. Congratulations to Mike Rampel for his recent appointment to lead Data Collaborative for Justice. Um, I, I couldn't help myself. Um, so I'm going to try to do this a little more conversationally, but I, I will be showing you some pictures and, and some data from um, some pretrial dashboards that my agency, the Criminal Justice Agency, uh, recently launched. Um, and I, I think by way of context, what I want to say is this morning we heard, you know, a pretty heated discussion at times um, with people with different points of view. But I think what stood out to me is a, a shared and sincere desire was for a trusted source of facts about what's going on with bail reform and our pretrial uh, process of release. And, and I think that is absolutely a, a goal that my agency, by releasing these pretrial dashboards, of which there are two and a third coming, uh, is trying to fill. And before I get into, I'm gonna show you four pictures, basically, and tell you some stories based on the pictures um, about this process of what does it mean to actually create a trusted and shared source of data about bail reform. Just a quick note on my perspective and my role. So I have the great privilege of running the uh, New York City Criminal Justice Agency. And one of the wonderful things about it is that we are both an agency known for research, um, but we're also an agency that provides pretrial services in New York City. So we have this dual role as both a researcher and a practitioner. And many of you may know this name, Jeremy Travis, our founding executive director, is the person who really encoded that combination of research and practice into our DNA, and we carry forward that today. So thank you, Jeremy, for that. <laughs> I won't stop until everyone gets applause. <laughs> <In my laughs> um, so um, uh, why did we do this work? I mentioned earlier that we wanted to try to provide a uh, trusted source of information about uh, pretrial release and pretrial conditions in New York City. But in some ways, the, the animating question for me was a really simple one. Um, how many people at any given time are actually released pretrial in New York City? One of the things that I find really fascinating about sort of people in the know in criminal justice circles is that I bet most of you can get within five or 10% the, the question correctly, how many people are held in New York City jails at, right now? And we know the answer. Vera has a wonderful tool, the jail viz tool, tells you there's 5,460 people yesterday held in New York City jails, of which 4,637 are held pretrial, right? Most people know that, I think, uh, who are uh, inside the system or knowledgeable of it. But what I realize is that no one really knows how many people are out awaiting the resolution of their case in New York City at any one time. That was the, the question I wanted to answer that started this journey of putting dashboards out. And as you'll see now, this is a live demonstration, right? You could actually go on the website right now and do what I'm doing. This is dangerous, right, if there's technical difficulties, but I'm willing to take the risk. Um, <laughs> So everything that I'm about to show you, you can do at home at nycja.org if you find our dashboards. So what does it tell you? In March 2022, a total of 40,323 people spent at least one day in the community awaiting their trial and pretrial release. And remember that number of people in jail awaiting pre the resolution of their case was about 4,600. So obvious relationship between those two things. Judge arraigns a case, they can do one of two things. They can choose a release condition that either leads directly or indirectly to pretrial detention, or they can release someone to the community. So we wanted to bring a kind of human note to what does it mean to be in this community of people, not who are at uh, Rikers or in jail, but who are actually been released in the community. And you'll see that in a sign, I think, of something that is quite healthy about our system, ideally you'd have as few as many people on pretrial release awaiting their trial. The number of people uh, who, again, have spent at least one day in a given month on pretrial release has gone down significantly. In January 2019, you had over 57,000 people who meet that description. And in March 2022, you have about over 40,000. So that number has gone down. But one of the things that you can do with this data tool, which is actually quite powerful, is you can slice the data in a number of ways. And what we've seen, and I think people who are knowledgeable of the system will know this, is that 
essentially the bottom has fallen out of the system. It's, there are far less people being released on a, a alleged misdemeanor charge than uh, in the past. However, the number of people who are being released in New York City where the charge that led to their release is a alleged violent felony offense has actually gone up. So you have a, a essentially, and this is sort of a meta theme of, of these dashboards, uh, a changing pool of releases. It's not just fewer people, but a different profile of those people. So keep that in mind as we go through um, some of these slides. So. Uh, not slides, this is a live demonstration of the dashboard. Okay, so uh, I wanted to point out something about the importance of pretrial practice in New York City. So I said earlier that there are uh, about 4,600 people held in New York City jails awaiting the resolution of their case. Supervised release, which is one of the options that a judge has uh, for releasing someone to the community, currently has, in March 2022, the most recent data that we have, over 6,000 people being supervised by supervised release. And Miriam Popper, who previously worked at Mockjay, who actually led the expansion of the program citywide, gets a lot of credit for this. We have a program called supervised release that is literally supervising more people while they're awaiting the conclusion of their case than are held at New York, in New York City jails awaiting the conclusion of their case. And I want to just pause on that for a second, and I'll, I'll return to it in one of the later things that I want to show you. I said earlier that I'm a practitioner and a researcher, right? So a lot of the debate about bail reform tends to take the form of, is it good or is it bad? That's not how a practitioner can see it. We don't have that luxury. The question that we face is, given the people that we have to responsibly help and serve, and try to encourage better outcomes for, what are the challenges that we face? So we don't ask good or bad questions. We ask questions about continuous improvement, nuance, and being very honest about what are the challenges that we face and how do we respond to them. Now, when I say that, that does not mean that I have taken a side in the debate about whether bail reform is good or bad. It is that I think about it differently because I am a practitioner. And if I had one sort of hope for the conversation about bail reform is that we pivot away from kind of op-ed style, is it good or is it bad type analysis towards, it is what it is for now, likely. How do we build a better system of pretrial release and pretrial infrastructure? Okay, so I said I was gonna show you a couple more pictures. This one is an interesting lesson in what I call humility about how an agency like ours produces data and how that data is consumed. So this chart has gotten us, quite frankly, in a lot of trouble, and I'm gonna explain why. So this chart tells you, of all the people in a given month released pretrial, how often in that month are they rearrested? This, our dashboards have gotten a lot of attention, a lot of media coverage, a lot of people have cited them positively and negatively, and this chart is the one that has gotten the most attention. It's the same thing that was cited in our earlier panel when a panelist said, before bail reform, about five people, 4% uh, of people were rearrested during the entire pretrial period. Now it's 5%. Okay, that is both true and false. <laughs> the data does show you that about 96% uh, of people released in New York City in that month were not rearrested before bail reform, and now it's 95%. Those arrests are only counted in that month. It is not the entire pretrial period, okay? Small differences in any given month can add up to larger differences over the entire pretrial period. Now, I don't think anyone has meant badly in taking a data point that only pertains to one month and, have, and citing it as the entire pretrial period. But it should be said that that is an incorrect representation of the data. Uh, and in fact, uh, and we will be following up with a dashboard in the future that will make this clear, we have actually seen increases in uh, pretrial uh, arrest rates um, while out on supervision over time. Very complicated reasons, very complicated story. Is this the uh, be-all and end-all explanation for increases in crime? Of course not. 
But again, as a practitioner, we have to live in reality. And the reality is that the risk pool of the population that we are dealing with is very different. So I'm going to end here. I don't, I don't have much more time. I said earlier that supervised release has now taken on uh, a much larger caseload of people. Um, and I've also said that the risk pool of people being released pretrial has changed. Part of that is because there are fewer low-level crimes, alleged crimes that are being um, brought into the court system. Uh, but another issue is the simple question of how often do people come to court having a, carrying a case with them? So you're arrested, you're arraigned in court, you have an open case already. So the question is, uh, is there a change in the percentage of times that people who are being arraigned by a judge carry with them a pending case? And to skip over a lot of complicated criminology, having a pending case is itself a good measure of the baseline risk that you will be arrested again, right? Simple concept. So what I want to leave you with is this, I think, fascinating visual representation of, of the kind of challenges that supervised release is facing. Full disclosure, my agency runs the supervised release program in Queens. So January 2019, about 29% of people who uh, were assigned to supervised release at arraignment by a judge had an open case that, that they brought with them. Today, that's about 50%. So supervised release is dealing with uh, in this rough and not totally precise way, but still important to remember, uh, a riskier group of individuals. And so my concern about the, the nature of the debate about bail reform, is it good or is it bad, is where does that leave a practitioner who has to say, how do I improve the program? How do I continue to innovate? How do I engage in a process of trial and error when the nature of the people coming into my program are different. We are left on the sidelines, unfortunately, when the only choice we have is to say whether bail reform is good or bad. So I, I do want, and I hope this dashboard is used as a way for people to engage in, a, in, a, in themselves in a more problem-solving and thoughtful approach to a very complicated issue. And just to leave you with the last thought here, I said earlier that we're both a researcher and a practitioner. This is what people who do both, this is how people who do both of those things think. And it's, it, it's a requirement, I think, for us to build a stronger pretrial infrastructure, which is what created the conditions for New York City to release more people than any other jurisdiction in the country before bail reform. That is, that is the infrastructure and the confidence and the orientation that allowed us to get there even before bail reform. And I think if bail reform is going to succeed, we have to maintain that perspective and use data to inform practice. Um, so, thank you. I'm Olive, um, Senior Research Associate at the Data Collaborative for Justice. And earlier this morning, President Mason had mentioned that we just recently released our latest uh, report looking at pretrial release outcomes in New York State. Uh, pre and post bail reform. So today I'd like to share with you some key findings from that report. Okay. So in this report, we looked at felonies, misdemeanors, and violations that were arraigned in 69 city and district courts throughout the state. So pretty, pretty great coverage. Um, between January 1st, 2019 and December 31st, 2020. So in order to kind of set the context for the rest of our analysis, we first looked at what was coming into the courts over these two years in terms of the total volume of arraignments. So what we found is, if you look at the statewide graph over there, um, there was a 38% decline in arraignments overall from uh, 2019 to 2020. And New York City had experienced the greatest declines compared to upstate courts and suburban New York City, which includes Westchester, Nassau, and Suffolk counties. So, substantial decline in arraignments overall. And with our data, we had the luxury of looking at arraignments 
uh, monthly. And we found that there was a substantial drop, again, in arraignments in the first quarter of 2020. So from January to April. And this, I'm sure you've already figured out, coincides with the onset of COVID, the closure of courts, and also, of course, the original bail reforms going into effect in April. So that was the context. Um, but our report uh, really was focused on looking at changes to pretrial release outcomes. So what are judges deciding at the point of arraignment um, when a person who has been charged appears in court? Um, are they deciding to release that person pretrial, whether by ROR, which is release on recognizance, um, or non-monetary conditions? Are they setting bail for these cases? Are they deciding to remand, or are they disposing these cases at arraignment? So this is really the crux of our report. Um, and we looked at this uh, by geography, by charge, and demographics, which I'll take you through um, as we go along. So here, uh, kind of the overall finding is that statewide, there was a 10 percentage point increase in the proportion of cases being released at arraignment. So the top purple line there. This is at the state level. New York City had the highest rate of pretrial release, both pre and post reform. And this isn't surprising, I don't think, since New York City has had pre-trial release services in place um, for a number of years. And uh, compared to New York City, upstate courts and suburban New, York, uh, suburban New York City courts were more likely to set bail um, kind of across the board over the study period. So just a couple of uh, kind of estimates that we made in our report. We wanted to estimate what would the outcomes look like had this increase not happened? So had this 10 percentage point increase not happened? So a counterfactual, if you will. And we estimate that more than 24,000 more cases would have faced bail or remand in 2020 without that increase. And considering that people are only able to pay post bail in 20% of the time where bail is set, we estimate that the reforms contributed to approximately 19,000 fewer cases that would have been uh, that would have resulted in pretrial detention. So, looking at charge severity, we found that the increase in pretrial release was especially uh, evident among felony cases, so increasing by actually. Oh, I want to go back to the last slide, but I don't know how to do that. One last thing that I forgot to mention here is if you, if we just pause on that purple line at the top for a, for a second, you see clearly that the increase in pretrial release actually started as far back as January of 2019. So, and the increase was pretty consistent up to about April when, you know, a lot of things happened. Okay, moving on. So, pretrial release increased by 17 percentage points among felony cases and a corresponding 17 percentage point drop in bail setting. So this is for felony cases throughout the state. And just diving a little deeper into felony cases for a moment, I want to draw your attention here to the orange bars. So these are representing the proportion of cases that where bail was actually posted. So bail was set and the person was able to post bail or arraignment. So although we saw that 17 percentage point drop in bail setting for felonies, bail posting actually dropped as well over the study period. And what that means is that even though fewer cases were getting bail set, less people were able to pay bail. Um, and this is especially evident if you look in the middle in suburban New York City, where um, the proportion of bail posting fell from about half of cases where bail was set in the first quarter of 2019 down to just a to less than a third by the end of 2020. And part of why that is, 
we hypothesize or the data is showing us is that even though we're finding that bail setting has declined overall and amongst felonies, uh, bail amounts have increased over the study period. Um, especially for felonies in suburban New York City and New York City. And just remember, in New York City, bail setting was actually much lower than the other parts of the state kind of throughout the study period. Okay, so we also looked at how outcomes vary by charge type and just a couple of points to highlight here. One is that pretrial release for drug cases increased by 26 percentage points over the entire study period. And this was uh, the, the greatest increase among all the other charge uh, categories. And two, and two, cases involving weapons charges, you'll see had a much flatter trend in terms of pretrial release. And they were also much more likely to have bail set at arraignment compared to all the other charge categories. And this is pretty consistent over the two years. So if we just isolate the bail setting lines, there was actually a four percentage point increase in rate of bail setting for uh, weapons cases. And then last but not, not least, uh, we looked at variation of outcomes by demographics. Unfortunately, we only had race, uh, 2019 race data for New York City courts, so we didn't have that for non-New York City courts. So we weren't able to do um, like a statewide pre-post analysis uh, for demographics, but we were, we were able to look at what was happening in 2020. So essentially from these three points, what we found is that statewide in 2020, young black men were least likely to be released pretrial and subsequently most likely to have bail set. And then when we did do the pre-post reform comparison uh, for New York City, we found that release rates increased by three to seven percentage points for most of our demographic groups. But despite this, disparities persisted in terms of who was getting released and who was still receiving bail. So we found that black and Latinx people were less likely to be released compared to white people, and especially when it involved felony charges. So a lot of findings condensed in a few minutes, but the key takeaways that I want to leave you with uh, today are first that pretrial release was increasing pre-reform, especially in New York City. Upstate and suburban New York City courts were more likely to set bail, and this was pretty consistent throughout the study period. Bail setting did decline, though, overall, um, particularly for felony cases, but bail amounts increased, and this is likely contributing to, people, uh, to people's reduced ability to post bail. Bail setting remained high and even increased for weapons charges. And then finally, uh, racial disparities persisted post-reform in terms of who was released and who was still uh, receiving bail. Thank you. So I'll turn over to my colleague, Jay Oak, who's going to talk about bail impact on jail populations. So. 